The American Diabetes Association is committed to preventing and ultimately curing diabetes. Thousands of the top researchers and physicians have come together at the 83rd Scientific Session in San Diego to showcase the newest treatments and technologies. Welcome back to San Diego. I'm Matria Godfrey, and this is our fourth and final day on ADA TV. Over the past 20 years, the number of adults diagnosed with diabetes has more than doubled due to factors like increased obesity, weight gain, and aging. To combat that, today, we are highlighting the latest cutting edge advances in diabetes research and care. Coming up on ADA TV, a new addition to the scientific sessions lineup this year. We go inside the new innovation challenge. Plus, today you will hear from this year's Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award winner. And the results are revealed. We share the new data being disclosed today from several key clinical trials. We've got a full final day ahead and we want to make sure you never miss a minute. You can always find the latest ADA TV episodes on our TVs placed throughout the Convention Center, on the in-house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the shuttle buses to and from the venue, on the ADA Scientific Session website, and on our Twitter and YouTube pages. But first, today we get started, just like we have each day this week, with Dr. Alice Chang. And you know, it has been an incredible week full of emerging science, breakthroughs in diabetes research, and some awards honoring those behind those discoveries. Anything in particular that has stood out to you over these last four days? I think, I mean, on a general level, one of the biggest things that stood out is just being able to see everyone. It was, it's been incredible. You're walking down the hallway and you're just seeing friends you haven't seen forever. So there've been a lots of hugs mm -hmm. um, throughout this uh, weekend, which yeah. has been fantastic. Uh, but I think one of the, the big themes that have really come out for me is uh, the innovation and how the future is just incredibly bright in terms of things that we can look forward to. We got readouts of amazing trials, uh, the awards lectures have been incredibly inspiring. And then, I mean, the Banting lecture was just absolutely incredible. And that the future of sort of multi-receptor agonism, I mean, everything, it was right. just incredible. We were speaking with one of the award winners yesterday and he said there has never been a better time to be in diabetes research. So that, that sentiment is shared. Any key piece of research that stood out to you this week, maybe from a clinical trial that you think is really a game changer or a breakthrough? So one of the things that impressed me with this meeting is there have been so many presentations that end with a picture of a paper that just came out simultaneously for what they just presented. So published in the New England Journal of Medicine, like published in the Lancet, so big journals. Yeah. And that's sort of how impactful these things have been. And, and I think the, the big one that really struck me uh, was looking at a small molecule oral um, GLP-1 receptor agonism with very little side effects, which I thought was just incredible. So sitting there as a clinician and thinking about what the future might look like was just so much fun. Awesome. Okay, let's talk about what we still have to look forward to. There is still another full day to go. Um, the year in review is still to come. Yes, so that is in the morning, and it's just a fantastic way to get a summary yeah. of all the amazing things that have happened, because it's nearly impossible to keep up as an individual. Uh, and then we have uh, three amazing speakers to, of course, uh, deliver that. And then there's the Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award lecture that will be coming up at 10.15. Uh, and, and the title, The Ailing Beta Cell in Diabetes, Insights from a Trip to the ER. And that's by Dr. Carmela Evans Molina. And then in the afternoon, we're gonna hear about the Coordinate study, uh, which is a very interesting study that's looking at a cluster randomized clinical trial that's testing the effectiveness of an innovative clinic level educational intervention to improve type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So it's, it's not a, a drug per se, but it's actually more about organization of care, which I think is an incredibly important topic. And then at 1.30 p.m., and everyone is very much looking forward to this, uh, this is a symposium showing the phase two study results of retitrutide, which is a novel triple agonist. And we heard about sort of alluding to that from our Banting lecture, so this is very exciting. And then last but certainly not least, at 3.15, uh, the long-term outcomes of the ARMS T2D randomized trial after seven to 12 years of follow-up. And it's a study of metabolic surgery versus lifestyle slash medical management of type two diabetes. So really lots of great stuff uh, coming up today on right. Monday. 
Everybody looks forward to those Monday trial results. Fascinating. All right, well, Dr. Chain, thank you so much for your time today. And just like she just mentioned, there is still much more to come with clinical trial results being revealed at this year's gathering. Let's take a look. We're very excited to present the results of phase two trials on Retitrutide on Monday afternoon. Retitrutide is a triple hormone receptor agonist. Specifically, it targets three nutrient stimulated hormones, GIP, GLP-1, and glucagon. We'll be presenting the results of a phase two study looking at specifically retitrutide for the treatment of obesity. We'll be showing results on efficacy and safety. Additionally, we'll present data on a subset of patients who had NAFLD in the study. And finally, we'll be presenting a second study, one looking at retitrutide in patients with type two diabetes. Again, looking at efficacy and safety. And again, this is a phase two study. We very much look forward to you attending our session. Well, we're very excited to have this opportunity to discuss in detail how we ran and what the results were of the coordinated diabetes study. And it was a study coordinated by Duke University that was really focused on getting cardiology clinics across the U.S. to increase their delivery of comprehensive risk reduction guideline-based care to people with type 2 diabetes and established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And we're really hopeful to, that we'll get the word out and provide resources and information that would allow practitioners across the United States to implement similar strategies at their locations. The president of medicine and science is involved in basically overseeing uh, many components of uh, research uh, priorities, research policies, uh, as well as advancing the uh, knowledge, the standards of care knowledge into the community. It was truly an honor to serve the American Diabetes Association in this role. I knew that I want to dedicate my entire career in providing care and doing research to stop diabetes and its complications. I never hoped that I would be awarded such an honor. It is really a humbling experience um, and it's even hard to express this in words. It is particularly significant to me because ADA had been instrumental in my career, helping with critical funding when I need it most, and allowing me an opportunity to uh, further um, test hypotheses and network with very esteemed colleagues and clinicians, and then um, enabling all these network opportunities um, and capacities to serve also to improve the care and to lobby the policy makers so that healthcare discoveries are in fact accessible to everybody who uh, has diabetes. The 2023 Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award is presented to someone whose research in diabetes has demonstrated particular independence of thought and originality. Dr. Carmela Evans Molina has been a leader in her field and is this year's award recipient. And we are so honored to have you here in studio with us today. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Let's start off with a congratulations. This is an incredible honor. What does it feel like to be awarded by your peers in this way? Uh, well, I mean, it's certainly the honor of a lifetime. I'm incredibly thankful to my colleagues for nominating me. Let's talk a little bit about your research and your body of work that has been honored. Yes. I am a faculty member at the IU School of Medicine, and um, I started my career uh, thinking at the very basic level about the pathways in the beta cell that lead to uh, beta cell dysfunction and diabetes. And um, in that regard, we are very interested in how calcium signaling in the beta cell impacts beta cell health and function uh, in type 1 diabetes. 
you know, this research has been longstanding, but how were you able to put your own special touch on this research that's already been out there? So I think one of the things that uh, maybe has been different about my career is that I, um, I trained as a physician, I'm an adult endocrinologist, and uh, early in my career I was able to take part in some clinical trial networks, uh, like TrialNet, which is focused on preventing type 1 diabetes. And so I think that that experience and that exposure to clinical research has allowed me to always think about my questions in a, in a very translational way. Interesting. Do you think that that's something that's sometimes lost in research, is actually taking it to, to the patient, to the bedside? Well, I think there's a really important role for all types of models in research. So uh, it's very important that we think about disease pathogenesis on a very molecular basis in preclinical models and in vitro models. Uh, but also I think it's important that we contextualize those findings uh, in the context of human disease. Right. Final question for you here. What do you hope that your body of work and all of your research will mean for the overall treatment of diabetes in the future? I, I kind of go back to this amazing group of colleagues that I have at the IU School of Medicine, and um, the vast majority of them are women in medicine uh, and women in research. And so I hope that maybe trainees and people behind me will look at this incredible group of people that I have an opportunity to work with and, and maybe even my own career and be inspired by that. Um, beyond that, I, again, I, I really hope that what we find in the lab and in our translational studies and in our clinical studies actually makes a difference for people who have diabetes. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on your honor and thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's your final day to take in all the on-site offerings. Make sure to stop by the sales pavilion on the upper level. In the ADA Shop Diabetes Bookstore, you can stock up on the latest professional publications and resources and show your support with ADA gear. And don't miss the membership lounge. Relax, have a snack, and charge your device while ADA staff answer any questions about membership renewal or benefits. And be sure to hit the exhibit hall. The ADA booth is a must-see before we wrap up today. One of the key highlights of the scientific sessions each year is the emerging science resulting from clinical trials. Here now is Dr. Vanita Arota with the findings from using oral semaglutide for the treatment of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So right now we have one oral TLP1 receptor agonist approved for use for treatment of type 2 diabetes, that's oral semaglutide. It's approved at a dose of 14 milligrams once daily. The OASIS-1 and Pioneer Plus trials tested higher doses of oral semaglutide up to doses of 50 milligrams for the treatment of uh, overweight and obesity in OASIS-1 and for the treatment of type 2 diabetes in Pioneer Plus. The target group for OASIS-1 was individuals with obesity as characterized by a body mass index above 30 or above 27 with weight-related comorbidities. The target group for Pioneer Plus was individuals with type 2 diabetes inadequately controlled on one to three other oral anti-diabetic agents whose A1C was still elevated at an 8 to 10.5 percent range. In Oasis 1, High dose oral semaglutide at 50 milligrams once a day compared to placebo showed a remarkably effective weight lowering effect at a mean difference of about 15%, with high numbers achieving at least 5, 10, 15, um, or more percent weight loss. In Pioneer Plus, the higher doses of oral semaglutide at 25 milligrams a day and 50 milligrams a day achieved superior glucose lowering compared to 14 milligrams a day and greater weight loss compared to 14 milligrams a day. What do these results mean for the future of obesity and diabetes treatment? It means that we'll have greater tools in the toolbox that target the underlying biology of both diabetes and obesity to support patient care and to support the goals that we are trying to achieve with our patients. What happens once these medications were stopped? Well, that wasn't tested in these particular trials, but in other studies, once medications are stopped, typically the biology starts coming back.
The concept of obesity treatment and type 2 diabetes treatment using dual incretin receptor activation has been met with both skepticism and optimism. Here to debate this dilemma is Dr. Carol Weisham and Dr. Earl Hirsch. Thank you both for your time this morning. Pleasure. Thank you. All right, Dr. Weisham, I want to get started with you because you say yes, we should absolutely be using these medications that we can't afford not to. Right. Why? So we traditionally thought about these meds for type 2 diabetes and a lot of the cost effectiveness analysis have been based upon type 2 diabetes and their co uh, conventional complications. But there are a lot of additional r medical risks associated with obesity to, and it costs our country something to the tune of $1.7 trillion in 2018 dollars. So it's a really costly um, disease and we need to apply everything we can to address this health care crisis. Dr. Hirsch, you argue though that there are costs associated with the drugs. In the United States, that is true. It really depends on what country we are in because the cost and the cost effectiveness is going to both depend on the country but also for the indication. We have obesity, we have type 2 diabetes, and we have cardiovascular disease. And the cost effectiveness of each one of these is different. And as a rule of thumb, especially in the United States, it's above what our willingness to pay is for other drugs, because in the US in particular, these drugs are so expensive. Dr. Weisham, you say though that there is more than just healthcare costs that we should be concerned with. Yes. In that one point trillion dollar number, about two-thirds of it is related to individual as well as societal costs of obesity. And so we have to worry about not only it's the economic costs, it's employment costs, it's the shaming costs, it's, you know, it's even climate change costs. Dr. Hirsch, what do you say to that, that there are these, you know, outside costs that maybe we should maybe take into consideration more than just drug costs? I completely agree with that. But the problem is these costs are so huge that that sort of outweighs everything. If you just think about obesity for a moment, our gross domestic product is $18.3 trillion. And if we just put everybody who's obese on this drug, this drug alone would cost $3 trillion. And it's just like, you just can't put all of your money in this one drug class for this one indication when we have everything else to think about. You referenced this a moment ago, the willingness to pay line. What is that and why is it controversial? So the willingness to pay line is a different line for each country. It's partly dependent on the economics in that country, the politics in that country, the amount of money in that country. Every country has a different willingness to pay. And in the U.S. it's quite high. Dr. Weishman, back to you. What do you say to people who say, you know what doesn't cost that much? Just change their diet and nutrition. What do you say to that? In the case of trying to do uh, diet and exercise, I mean, every study that has been done, you know, intensively, at a cost, you know, weight comes down, but then drifts back up. In patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes, they have structural changes within their appetite regulating center that prevents them from having normal response uh, in terms of hunger and weight. And so it's extremely hard to ignore hunger. And that's what these drugs do, is they go in and actually kind of rewire the appetite center so that people can control their appetite. Final question for you both. You know, the, the use of these drugs to treat obesity has really taken off. What do you think is the future? I feel like once the cat's been let out of the bag, trying to rein using these drugs back in as a method to treat obesity. What these drugs do for this indication and all indications, it further separates out the haves and the have-nots. It's important to know that most of the people that you're reading about are paying cash. Yes. That's their willingness to pay. Mm -hmm. And that is not going to extend, you know, with a median income of $53,000, something that's going to cost $12,000 a year is just not going to be able to be afforded by people who are below the median income in the United States. Very good point. All right, we're going to leave it at that. Thank you both for your time today. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. A new addition to the Scientific Sessions lineup this year, the Innovation Challenge invited six contestants to pitch their concepts for improving the lives of people living with diabetes before a panel of potential funders. Let's take a look. Our bodies are complex systems. No one is a drug-free therapy. There's nobody been thinking about that before. The Innovation Challenge brings 
a number of contestants that were chosen to have the best ideas to help improve the lives of people with diabetes. They're entrepreneurs with startup companies, and they'll be pitching their ideas to three judges that will identify the top three folks. And then the audience gets to weigh in on who they think the best ideas are. And it's really our hope that we help to move forward the startup world, which is an important part of innovation. One of the whole goals of coming to Sandvik Sessions is to learn new things and experience new things in new ways and to spark that creativity, bring people together. And the Innovation Challenge is pretty much that. The winner gets to, to engage more with, the, with these uh, judges, the, the venture capitalists, the, the funders, and hopefully, ultimately, get some support for the future. There are so many wonderful solutions for people with diabetes that are coming out of the startup world. It's not only the academic world, which is where we typically think of the, the advancements happening. And so we wanted to highlight that, bring that to this audience, and help nurture this, this movement to find solutions for people with diabetes. What a way to wrap up a fantastic week. We have enjoyed bringing you all the specially curated content all week long, from our sit-down interviews to fascinating findings from the latest clinical trials. We hope that you've enjoyed the tour of the institutions and organizations leading the charge in the fight against diabetes. We may be wrapping up, but our content lives on. Check us out on the TV's place throughout the convention center, on the in-house channels at several of our partner hotels, on the shuttle buses to and from the venue, on the ADA Scientific Sessions website, and of course on our Twitter and YouTube pages. Thanks so much for joining us here on ADA TV. We hope to see you again for next year's Scientific Sessions in Orlando, Florida. Safe travels, everyone.